coming up next on the IP Talk stage, Thomas Wong from Global Foundries presenting Leadership in 28 Nanometer Capacity. Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the Global Foundry uh, update for 2012. So what I'd like to talk about today is to give you an update and the progress report at Global Foundry and our investment in global capacity at the leading edge um, and also our technology roadmap um, starting with 28 going down to 20 and 14. Better. It's louder. Okay, great. So as our name implies, we are global foundries, so we have to be global. Uh, we are presently um, have tw uh, 12,000 people on three continents. Uh, we have major operations in Europe, in Singapore, and in the US. Uh, our 300 millimeter fab uh, are in Dresden, Germany, Singapore, and New York, and we have our mature fabs at 200 nanometer in Singapore. We currently, uh, at least at last count, have over 160 customers, and most of the major customers and names that you would recognize. They're probably in the top 10, top 20 of the largest semiconductor companies in the world. Um, based on the amount of capital expenditure investment that we have made um, in facilities, in uh, R&D technology, uh, we are on track to, to grow pretty fast. And I think uh, we're now number two in the industry, in the merchant uh, foundry market. And I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about that later. And from a capacity standpoint, uh, we have ship 4.5 million wafers on an annualized basis, and that's based on 200 millimeter um, dimension uh, scaling. So that's a big, uh, quick snapshot of um, at the high level. And as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, manufacturing in Saratoga Springs, New York, Dresden, Germany, and Singapore. In addition to that, uh, we also have a number of locations for sales and support, so we're close to our customers. Uh, for example, uh, there is the, the orange dot on the left-hand side without uh, any address. Uh, that's Milpitas, our U.S. headquarters, and that's where I go to work. Uh, and I did not make the foils. Uh, and also in, uh, in Austin, we have a major um, uh, developer center and also sales office. Uh, over in Europe, uh, we have, um, in addition to the FAB, sales and support in uh, Munich and also in London. Over in Asia, Pacific, and Japan, uh, we have operations in Yokohama, Japan, Shinshu in Taiwan, and also Shanghai. So we are pretty um, diversified in terms of locations and uh, how we support our customers. So when our Global Foundry got started, uh, one of the basic premise was that we want to have uh, advanced leading edge process technology manufacturing located in places where uh, our customers do business. And also to make sure that we don't concentrate all the fabs in one location in one country. And that was the founding direction. And that's why we named the company Global Foundry. Um, and, and besides, um, in the traditional foundry merchant space in the past, uh, they're very geographically located. Like um, you have engineering, manufacturing in one country. You do all the stuff there. Uh, you have homegrown technology. But our vision for that is a little bit different. Uh, if you understand the history of Global Foundry, where they came from, you understand that we're very big on collaboration and cooperation. Uh, in terms of the technology side, we have a long-term alliance with the IBM Semiconductor Alliance, and also a history with a common platform uh, for over 10 years. Uh, so we rely on our partners uh, to do a lot of this interesting work uh, to gain knowledge from other teams that are pursuing the same technology space. Uh, and from a capacity standpoint, in the foundry business, it's always been opportunistic in investment. When your customers come to you and say, gee, I wish I could get more wafer starts, and you tell them they have no capacity, and that's where foundry starts scrambling to put in capacity. But that is not going to help, because for the time that you put investment to buy the equipment, the time you get silicon out of that fab, if you're lucky, you can get it in 18 months. But our principle is very different. We look at the market, and we decide at what point and what capacity we need. And we put an investment in place to make sure we have a systematic bring up of additional capacity as time goes on. Um, and we touch on the 28 nanometer in a, in, a, in a minute because that seems to be the hot topic right now in terms of capacity. Uh, so in a nutshell, Global Foundry wants to be your foundry partner. We don't want to be simply your contract manufacturer for wafers. Uh, that's kind of like the 1990 story. I think going forward, 
the technology is getting so difficult to design and unless we're getting together as a partnership with close collaboration at the design stage, uh, up to and including before we even go into production. Uh, so that partnership is extremely important. And we also have lined up a lot of the ecosystem behind it, like companies like Chip Estimate, a lot of the IP vendors and EDA vendors. Uh, we all have to come together as a team before we can get this thing to work. This is one of the interesting things that, um, that I look at when I first joined the company a few months ago. So this is the history of where uh, Global Foundry come from. In October 2008, ATIC and AMD decided to put a joint venture together to spin off the uh, manufacturing arm of AMD, and they call it the, uh, the Foundry Company. So this is where the uh, genesis of the company is. And in March of 2009, um, they officially renamed the company and called it Global Foundry. And in July 2009, uh, we, we did a groundbreaking to start the construction in uh, Malta, New York. Uh, I think we use all these terms loosely. We say Saratoga Spring, Malta, New York, it's the same place. It's a gigantic manufacturing plant. Uh, if you were watching ABC News uh, a couple of months ago, they actually did a, um, a very short clip on uh, ABC Nightline with uh, Diane Sawyer. And uh, the ABC News crew were flying in on a helicopter and took a shot of this uh, uh, very forestry area in uh, upstate New York, and right in the middle you get this gigantic factory, uh, which is us. And um, further down in the, um, the development of the company, in December 2009, um, ATIC purchased Chartered Semiconductor. So we combined the Chartered and the AMD operation um, under one roof, and we operate as a single company at that point onwards. And in June of 2010, uh, we announced plans for expansion of capacity in both Dresden and New York. This is the part about anticipating customer demand, uh, putting capacity in place before the demand actually hits because it takes time to get there. Um, and in June uh, 2011, about a year after we broke ground in uh, Malta, uh, we have achieved uh, FAB ready for equipment installation. So it took about a year, which is pretty amazing uh, for an advanced FAB. And in 2011, December, six months after the equipment is being put in, uh, we started building wafers off the fab in Malta. So this is probably one of the largest infrastructure investment in the US, and probably one of the fastest ramp up of a, of a leading edge fab uh, in this industry. And on March 2011, I think if you track the EE Times or other news out there, there was a big story about um, Global Foundry gained independence uh, because we finally bought out the uh, remaining shares of AMD. So we don't, um, we don't have any other shareholders anymore. And this is important for us to be independent, also important for some of my, my customers because customers are always concerned about when you have a large um, chip company being one of your shareholders, would you favor one versus the other? So, so there was a milestone for the company based on the inception plan, and it finally got realized in March of 2012. So in 2009, when the company was first founded, we're number four in the foundry space, in uh, Pure Play Foundry. In 2010, uh, with the acquisition of the merger with Charter, we became number three. And then as of the end of 2011, through organic growth, and thanks to all the customers out there, uh, we are finally solidly number two in the business. And um, the rest, uh, I think uh, we're going to continue to work hard, trying to uh, make sure all the customers are happy. And um, someday, we'll get there. But it's going to take time. In terms of the uh, product portfolio for the company, we are a broad line foundry supplier. Pure Play Foundry, we don't compete with our customers. We've got mature technology ranging from, believe it or not, um, half micron. Well, that's like my grandfather's technology. So we got the mature technology from 0.5 down to 0.35, all the way down to um, 65 nanometer. And then we have what we call the mainstream technology, the 55, 45, and 40, and the leading edge, 32 and 28, and the bleeding edge, um, 20. So as you scan across the chart, uh, it gives you an idea of the different uh, value-added solutions that we add onto the process for different applications. 
uh, on the top end, the 32 and the 20, and those are really high performance designs for mobility and for connectivity. And then for the 45, 55, we've added on things like e-flash. Those are more for uh, industrial automotive, uh, where they need to have onboard flash. And on the right hand side, you see this little column here called SOI. Um, those are really high performance uh, process that we use to build uh, high performance microprocessors. In terms of well, worldwide capacity at 300 millimeter, uh, we used our fab in Germany, we call it fab one, for 45 nanometer silicon, uh, going to 32, 28, and 20. And presently, we have capacity of uh, 80,000 wafers a month uh, in the Dresden fab. In Singapore, we call it the fab seven. Um, we make products from 130 to 40 uh, in the 300 millimeter line. And we currently have capacity of 50,000 wafers per, per month. And FAB8, a brand new FAB in New York, uh, is really the, um, the Cadillac, right? The 32, 28, going to 20 and 14. Uh, we have capacity for 60,000 wafers a year. And we have started making silicon in that FAB as of December of last year. In terms of leading edge technology, uh, we are covering the entire application space from high performance computing to communications and networking and to mobility. So if you look at uh, in 2011, uh, we have ramped up uh, 3228 for our processor customers. And we also have launched our low power 28 SLP process for the mobility space. And this is the space where you see people building uh, tablets, ultrabook, smartbook, uh, uh, handheld uh, gaming devices. And in 2012, uh, we have launched a high performance 28 nanometer called the 28 HPP. And that particular process node uh, and technology is suitable for computing, communications, uh, and also networking. And further down in 2012 and maybe uh, beginning 2013, uh, we'll be launching an additional uh, technology for the mobility space called the 20 LPH. So it retains the same power performance and the low leakage um, of the 20 SLP, but it just gives the extra boost in performance in terms of speed, in gigahertz uh, as you measure clock speed and also uh, CPU speed. Uh, moving on to 2013, uh, we'll be launching our 20 LPM. And as you can see from, uh, from this chart, that there's only one 20 nanometer that we're gonna be deploying. Uh, and we believe that this technology can, uh, can cover the entire application space from mobility to um, to networking, to communications, and also to high-performance computing. So it'll be one single technology process. I think it makes our job a bit, a bit easier. Uh, and I think it's also easier for customers not to have to make too much trade-offs. And from a foundry uh, enablement and ecosystem perspective, uh, this would help us a lot in uh, getting all the IP vendors uh, to support one common platform, as opposed to have them do two or three different things for the same process node. And moving to 2014, uh, that would be the, um, the launch of the 14 nanometer. And 14 nanometer would be uh, Global Foundry's first uh, FinFET process. Uh, so we're not doing a 20 FinFET right now. And um, even though the 2013 launch was uh, 20 LPM, uh, we are currently working with customers already on the bleeding edge customers that absolutely have to get there in production by 2013, and we've been working with them already. So there's active engineering collaboration in place right now. And this is the uh, ecosystem chart. I mean, we are a pure play foundry. Uh, we don't do a lot of IP development in-house. We don't do EDA tools. Um, and in order for us to have good and proper support to all the customers, we need to have a lot of partners. So as this chart uh, indicates, we have partners in the IP space. We have partners in the... Um, EDA space, uh, we're partners in the design services space, uh, we're partners in manufacturing, in, um, in packaging. So, so this give, gives you a, a snapshot of uh, some of the, um, the partners in the ecosystem that we have established over the last few years. Um, let's skip this one. And in order for, for us to bring I mean, all the process advantages, the performance advantages to the customer, being a pure play foundry, like I mentioned earlier, right, we do have to have a very robust IP ecosystem, which we have that in place. 
Um, and we also have to have a design solution um, partnership in place with major third party developers um, that will help customers do design, uh, to do tape out, to do time enclosure. So that system has been put in place over the last several years and it's up and running. On the 28 nanometer, uh, we have already designed into multiple products spanning across the globe from the mobility space in smartphone, in tablets, in PC, to the communication space in, um, in networking, um, to the consumer space in digital television. Um, so this thing is uh, beginning to, to roll out and I think you will see our chips inside our customer's product uh, in, uh, in a very short time. Unfortunately, we don't have this inside Global Foundry branding, so people may not even know the chips uh, come from us. And I'm also happy to report to you that as of March 21, uh, I think there's a press release that came out at that time uh, when the industry was uh, talking about high K metal gate um, versus PolyScion, and people were saying, well, the founders have a hard time building a uh, high K metal gate, and there's gonna be a problem going forward. Well, I'm very happy to tell you that uh, we have shipped quarter of a million wafers in high K metal gate as of March. And as of May, I think we have shipped probably close to 400,000 wafers in high K metal gate. So I think we can uh, confidently say that global foundries have shipped more high K metal gate than anybody on the planet today. So we are there, we're making the product, it's reliable and we can build it and we know how to build it and we have the capacity to do that. So pretty, uh, pretty much uh, the most important message for this particular foil. So in summary, um, we are heavily investing in bleeding edge technology. We have a, a planned CapEx um, investment in 2012 of $3 billion. And since the foundation of the company, we're putting $11 billion in plant, equipment, technology development, and a little bit on my salary. <laughs> Just rounding, rounding error. And in terms of worldwide capacity, uh, we have a mature 200 millimeter fab in Singapore. Uh, and that is also uh, the location where we'll be doing uh, MEMS products for customers. And Fab 7, uh, which is the fab in Dresden, uh, we also have put in additional investment uh, to make that conversion from um, a more mature technology to 45, 40 nanometer. And in FAB1, our Cadillac FAB in New York, uh, we have to basically continue expansion and build up the, uh, the capacity uh, to bring our 28, 20, and 14 nanometer technology to the marketplace. Um, and FAB8 is ramping and we're making silicon. So with that, um, I thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, come by and see me.